Hello and welcome to Dr. Young's Ancient Egypt. We're studying New Kingdom Egypt and today what I'd like to look at is the burial ground at Thebes, otherwise known as the Valley of the Kings. There's a lot of other stuff around that area that we want to look at as well. Generally referred to as the Theban Necropolis. Necropolis is a Greek term which means City of the Dead, so it's basically a giant cemetery. But we'll be looking at some of those royal burials and some of that fascinating stuff from uh, the Valley of the Kings and that region in Thebes. Thebes was an important city in Upper Egypt. It was the capital of the kingdom during the Middle Kingdom period and then it was the capital again during the 18th dynasty of the New Kingdom period which is of course the period that we're studying. During the Middle Kingdom period the kings of um, Egypt began to build their tombs on the edges of the cultivated zone to the west of the city of Thebes. And if we have a look at the general area here, we can see over here an aerial photograph. So over here we have the cultivated area, then we have sand desert in this area here, and then the mountains beyond. And so they would start to build their temples and funerary monuments in this area here, just at the ed edge of the cultivated area. Now over here we've got the River Nile, so you've got the Nile, then the cultivated area, you can see, as we were talking about before, that really sharp delineation between the cultivated area and the desert area. And then you've got this line of cliffs here and the funerary temples and monuments, for the most part in the Milk Kingdom in particular, were constructed just at the edge here. Uh, often they would consist of a funerary temple and a small pyramid and the tomb would be located underneath the pyramid in the rocks in the cliffs behind here. Now of course during the Middle Kingdom and in particular during the Second Intermediate Period that came after the Middle Kingdom, you began to have a lot of tomb robbery and looting and by the time we get to the New Kingdom period when the 18th Dynasty rulers had established themselves in Thebes and established themselves as rulers over the entirety of Egypt, thus bringing in the whole New Kingdom period, they began to follow along with that practice, but they rapidly realised that this wasn't very secure, it was in many ways no more secure than those giant pyramids were back in the Old Kingdom period. Of course, by this time, they had been completely pillaged and looted. And so from the time of Hatshepsut, still in the early 18th dynasty onward, they began the practice of building a funerary temple here, or somewhere in this area here, some of them are right down here, others sort of like in this flat area here and others right against the cliffs. But rather than having the tomb immediately behind the funerary temple, they started to build them in the valleys behind here in a secret location that we now know as the Valley of the Kings. So if we have a look at the map here, we've got the cultivated area here, we've got that flat area that you can see there over here, and then in the hills behind you can see the Valley of the Kings located here. So you've got all of those temples in this area and then the tombs are located in a secret valley behind the cliffs. Back in those days you could only get it there by following paths over the hills. Nowadays you actually take a road that goes all the way around here and comes into the valley that way. We also have Deir el Medina here which is the uh, village that was used by the people who were constructing the tombs. So that was a very privileged workforce, a very important workforce because of course the Egyptian rulers believed that they needed all of these things in order to both to secure their own passage to the afterlife but also that they would be able to protect the kingdom of Egypt once they were in the afterlife. So if you're king you had that job as well as just making sure that you were looked after, you had to continue to look after the kingdom. Uh, while you are in the afterlife. So in order to make sure of that they needed, well, they believed they needed all of these things to be constructed, particularly the funerary temple here where the worship of the deceased king would continue through eternity as they understood it, and then the tomb which would protect the mummy and the grave goods for all eternity because they believed that their soul, their car, soul and car aren't exactly interchangeable but close enough for our purposes now, um, they would, they needed to be protected and so they wanted to make sure that those tombs were well concealed. So they were dug out of the rock up in the Valley of the Kings. So what I'd like to look at then is 
to have a look at three major areas. First of all, the funerary temples. Then I want to have a look at the Deir el Medina, the workers' village here, and then the Valley of the Kings. Of course, there's several other important localities in this area as well. We've got the Valley of the Queens, which is, as the name implies, the queens of some of the rulers, also princes and other high nobles located over here, mainly from the 19th dynasty onward. Uh, for example, it's a couple of sons of uh, princes, sons of rulers and so forth. We've got uh, the tombs of the nobles, so there's quite a lot of tombs of nobles and various other high officials from the 18th, 19th and 20th dynasties located particularly in the area around the funerary temples. Now, back here in the Valley of the Kings, that seems to have just been reserved for royalty, but the nobles' tombs are located all around here and there were tombs of the inhabitants of Deir el Medina as well uh, located in this area. So it's a very, very rich archaeological area. If you ever get the chance to go to Egypt, uh, then please take it because it's a fantastic area to visit and have a look at. And uh, there's a lot to see there. The first things I want to look at are the funerary temples. So we'll be looking at a few of those that are located in this area around here. So these were the temples that were built at the same time as the tombs and they were very important from the Egyptian religious perspective because this was where people would come to bring offerings and to continue the cult of the deceased king. He was to be worshipped as a god uh, throughout the remainder of eternity and that was where that cult actually took place. It was also the place where a lot of the important ceremonies before the burial took place. So they were a very important part of the actual funeral and before the burial of the deceased king. Some of these haven't survived all that well. This is the wall that remains of the funerary temple of Amenophis III. And there are just these two giant statues known today as the Colossi of Memnon. And there was an enormous temple apparently quite remarkable in its size immediately behind them. Because this is actually in the cultivated area of the Nile Valley rather than in the desert, there's nothing left of it apart from these two statues. And that illustrates some of our problems of preservation in ancient Egypt because a lot of the stuff that we have actually comes from the desert region because here it was ploughed over, it was reused again as farmland, it's much moister so things uh, uh, less well preserved in that area anyway and so the temple has basically been completely demolished whereas other temples located further back in the desert area you can just see in the background there have been much better preserved because nobody farms that area so they basically left it alone these statues were quite famous in antiquity some of the graffiti on them uh, goes back a couple of thousand years romans and greeks that visited ancient egypt the egyptian tourism industry is about two thousand years old uh, would actually carve their names on the statues. These were famous because they used to emit this whistling sound at the, as the dawn. So as the sun hit them early in the morning, they would emit a whistling sound. And the Greeks and Romans believed that these were statues of Memnon, who was a hero who was killed in the Trojan War, fighting on the Trojan side, killed uh, by the Greeks. And by Achilles, I think. And they believe that uh, this, this, the sound rather, was the Eos, the god of the dawn, goddess of the dawn, mourning her son, who was killed. Um, we don't actually know what caused the noise. It doesn't make it any more because one Roman emperor, Septimius Severus, decided he was going to fix the statues. You can see they're kind of crumbling and falling apart. So he fixed them, and as a result, uh, the sound ceased to be made. So we don't really know what it was. Another important temple is the temple of Hatshepsut. She built this magnificent temple, as you can see, right against the cliffs. There's actually a Middle Kingdom temple that it seems to be modeled on and enlarged from over here. So this is one of those Middle Kingdom temples and burials over here, Mentehotep II, I think. Um, and then we have Hatshepsut's much larger and more imposing temple over here. This terrace design seems to have been inspired by the Middle Kingdom temple that was next to it. However, unlike previous rulers, Hatshepsut had her tomb not located immediately behind the temple, but rather uh, in the Valley of the Kings. So she was one of the very first rulers to do that. 
the whole practice stayed pretty much the same throughout the 18th, 19th and 20th dynasties. So we go from the 18th dynasty with Hatshepsut to the 19th dynasty, the Ramesseum, the mortuary temple of Ramesses II, which is located also right on the edge of the cultivated area. So this is a very famous temple. Uh, what's left of it, uh, the mortuary temple of Ramesses II. You can see Ramesses II's major decorative device that he seemed to really like was giant statues of himself. He put them up all over Egypt. If you go to Egypt nowadays, chances are if you are looking at a great big ancient Egyptian statue, it's of Ramesses II. Um, he also was a bit rude to some previous rulers because he would actually just carve his cartouche, his name, on the statues of earlier kings and claim it was a statue of him as well. So a lot of them have his name on them, not all of them actually were originally of him. But these ones here, these colossi here in the Ramesseum were all uh, of him. Then we get to the 20th dynasty and Ramesses III. This is Medinet Habu, the, Ram the mortuary temple of Ramesses III, basically the last great temple construction in the New Kingdom period. After the reign of Ramesses III, the New Kingdom went on a pretty much a downhill slope that we'll talk about later on when we get into a historical overview of the New Kingdom. Um, but, of course, a wealthy country can build big temples like this a country that's been bankrupted by wars and civil wars and so forth can't and that's basically what seems to be going on in the latter part of the 20th dynasty. So Ramesses III is sometimes regarded as the last great pharaoh of Egypt. That's a bit of a subjective judgment but there's a case for it at any rate. But this is his temple at Medinet Habu, also on the edge of that cultivated area. Immediately behind the cultivated area, in the valleys behind it, in the desert area, we have a very interesting village, Deir el Medina. Deir el Medina is an ancient Egyptian village, typical in some ways I suppose, but very unique in others. Because it was the village that the workforce who actually built the tombs, who built the necropolis, lived in. So the architects, the painters, uh, all of the people that looked after them, the stonemasons, everyone like that lived in this village. All, pretty much all, of the other villages of ancient Egypt were built in that cultivated area and so they've been destroyed by years of farming uh, over the centuries and by the annual flooding of the Nile and so those villages haven't survived because Deir el Medina is built up in the hills behind uh, the cultivated area it's much better preserved and archaeologists have found a huge amount of information uh, by excavating this. So here you can see the layout of the village, you've got all these houses very tightly packed up around here you've got some of the tombs of the inhabitants of Deir al-Medina uh, in their spare time after building the pharaoh's tombs uh, they would build their own up in the hills around about the village. You can see here there's also some uh, funerary monuments and, and temples and so forth, similar things to that. So Deir al-Medina is a fascinating site, it's a huge amount of information that's come out of there and that tells us about that workforce that constructed those tombs back in the 18th, 19th and 20th dynasties, particularly the 19th and 20th, although certainly it got started in the 18th dynasty. One of the most fascinating finds there was the virtually untouched tomb of Carr and Merritt. Carr was an architect and uh, Merritt uh, in the 18th dynasty and Merritt was his wife. So here we have the coffin of Carr and we have uh, Merritt's beauty box basically. It's all of her uh, ointments and makeup and so forth that she used. Unlike nearly all of the tombs of ancient Egypt, the tomb of Ka and Merit was not looted. Now, it's, the grave goods were pretty impressive, not as impressive perhaps as the grave goods of Tutankhamun, which were found in 1922. These were found earlier than that. And for a long time, this was the only really untouched Egyptian burial that had been uncovered. Uh, then, of course, Tutankhamun's tomb was uncovered in 1922, and that kind of eclipsed this one. Uh, most of the grave goods are actually on display in the Egyptian Museum in Turin, in Italy. Uh, TT8 here is just the code name or number of the tomb. Uh, all of the tombs of the Theban necropolis have a number. Uh, some of them like this, TT just stands for Theban tomb. Um, others, particularly the ones in the 
Valley of the Kings are all pre-numbered KV, Kings Valley, and then a number following them like that. But very impressive, and uh, for those of you studying my Ancient Studies course, we'll be having a look at a BBC documentary that looks at, it's called Life and Death in the Valley of the Kings, so it's on YouTube, and it's basically about Cart and Merritt, their life, and the kind of things that were found in their tomb, so give that a look. Another impressive thing that was found in Dar el Medina are the ostracon. Now, ostracon is just a broken piece of pottery, and that's all the word means, but when we're talking about an ancient primary source, it's usually something that's been painted or drawn upon. Uh, paper, papyrus to the Egyptians, and paper and other things like that was actually quite expensive and difficult to produce. So if you just wanted to scribble something down, if you wanted to write a letter to someone, often you would actually paint it or use ink on a broken piece of pottery, and that was the cheapest and easiest way of writing a letter. And so we've actually got a massive archive. There was a huge pit that they, the inhabitants of Dero Modena tried to use as a well, didn't actually get down to the water table, so they ended up just chucking all their rubbish in it. Rubbish in it. And a lot of the rubbish, or some of it, was an archive of letters. And so these letters are from various people in the, uh, in the necropolis village at Dero Medina, some from various officials writing to one another, people complaining about their job, or someone, you sent me this guy to do this job and he's no good. Uh, there's one guy that writes to his overseer asking for beer because he wants more beer, at least he's upfront about it. Uh, all kinds of stuff like that. It's a fascinating archive of material. Others are artistic, so here we've got a rather beautiful depiction of a dancer here who looks particularly agile, but um, that's one of the artistic representations from the archive at Dar el Medina. So there's artistic work, there, is, uh, there are letters, and lots and lots of other, there's laundry lists, there's all kinds of stuff that was discovered in this archive. So it's uh, an amazing archive and hugely informative. So we don't just know about the kings and queens of ancient Egypt, we've got some idea about people who are further down the social scale. We know something about the nobles, and you'd probably call the people that lived in Dero Medina upper middle class, I suppose, or something like that. Carr and Merritt were obviously well off. Carr was someone who was very high up in the pecking order of the necropolis village at Dero Medina. We don't know very much at all, really, about the life of your everyday peasants because, unfortunately, virtually nothing survives from them. We don't hear their voice. We, there's really not represented amongst the, uh, the surviving information that we have, not even in villages such as this, because this was a particularly well-off village of people who were quite privileged and important as far as uh, ancient Egypt was concerned. So that's Dar el Medina. We'll now move on to the Valley of the Kings, which is located, as I said, in the hills behind uh, the cultivated area of the Nile, behind that line of cliffs. And so here we have a picture in the Valley of the Kings. This is right in the middle of the valley. We don't know precisely why it was selected, but some have suggested it's because of this peak that was shaped like a pyramid. So rather than actually build a pyramid, they just decided that they were going to locate all the tombs immediately underneath or in the vicinity of this kind of natural pyramid. So that's one possible explanation. But whatever the explanation, there's heaps of tombs in this valley and all of these sort of sub-valleys branching off the valley located for the most part in the side, so carved into the cliffs around the side here. So you can see these entrances to tombs here and here and over here as well, and they're scattered all throughout the valley. Now these of course are modern entrances, this stonework here is all built up so that people can enter the tombs nowadays. Of course in ancient times this would all be covered over and it would be concealed as much as possible to try and prevent anyone from actually locating the tomb and uh, trying to Loot it, pillage it. Uh, this one here, I believe, is the entrance to the tomb of Tutankhamun, which is unusual in that it's located in the valley floor rather than built into the sides, uh, like these tombs around about it. There's one sort of like right up immediately behind the uh, tomb of Tutankhamun. So as we go through the uh, valley, we can see here this is a plan of the valley, and so you've got all of these tombs here. You can see they've all got a KV number located on them and so you go KV2, 3, 46, 62, uh, KV9 there, 
eight. So you see some of these are very massive. The very largest two of all is KV5, which we'll talk about in a moment. All of those tombs are located uh, through this area. They're basically numbered in the order that they were discovered. Uh, so the tomb of Tutankhamun, KV62, is the second last of the tombs that was discovered. The most recent was discovered in 2005, KV63. Probably not a royal tomb, but rather a storage area and preparation area for the royal burials rather than an actual royal burial itself. So the tombs are basically numbered KV1 through to KV62. And you can see the sprawl of all of these tombs. You can see how they kind of come into one another. So you've got this one coming back here, crosses over that one, and this one almost makes contact with it, um, coming back into the, the cliff in that way. So some of these are huge, very impressive, and as you can see, KV5 there is a massive labyrinth of, um, <clears throat> of chambers and passageways and so forth, and halls uh, located all the way through it. Most of the royal burials are very large and impressive, uh, very highly decorated, particularly when you get into the 19th dynasty, they're very, very highly decorated. Some of the best known tombs, if you go there today, you get a ticket and that allows you to th see three tombs. Often they're tombs of the 20th dynasty pharaohs, uh, Ramesses third through to 11. And even though we know very little about those pharaohs, they're, ironically, they're some of the best known and most famous uh, of the tombs that are available. The tomb of Ramesses VI, for example, actually concealed the tomb of Tutankhamun. When it was built in the 20th dynasty, the huts for the workers were built over the top of the tomb of Tutankhamun, and that's actually what concealed the, that tomb and uh, preserved it. And Ramesses VI tomb is immediately located above that, uh, the tomb of Tutankhamun. And so that's one of the reasons that the tomb was actually buried and concealed. Uh, so some of those lesser known pharaohs of the 20th dynasty, they're actually the ones you're likely to see if you go and visit uh, the Valley of the Kings. Some of the early 18th dynasties, such as Thutmose III, are actually buried up in these remote valleys that branch off the main valley. So that's your main valley there. Then you've got these valley, these tombs branching off them. So you can see some of these ones up here are some of the actual earliest ones from the 18th dynasty. One example that we can look at from the 19th dynasty, KV17, the tomb of Seti I. So you can see it's uh, got a very long entrance passageway, a couple of uh, false passageways to try and mislead robbers. Didn't work because the whole thing was looted. And then you come into these chambers, and the burial chambers, and the symbolic burial chamber behind it, antechambers, and so forth all the way through. You can see here from this photograph that it's very highly decorated all the way through, so it's beautiful paintings. Um, one of the reasons, when you, if you, again, if you go there, uh, they won't let you take flash photography because that will actually um, damage the painting. And uh, don't try the guards, because I saw it did, did happen once. I saw one guy decide to sneak out his camera and take a quick flash photograph. Uh, a couple of guards just grabbed him and sort of like frog marched him out and literally threw him out of the tomb. So it was quite entertaining to watch, but he wasn't having fun. So don't do that. But there's a good reason why you shouldn't. So you can see, very highly decorated, very large and elaborate tomb. The largest tomb of all is KV5, the tomb of the sons of Ramesses II. It's often called sons of Ramesses II. There's actually some daughters in there as well. Ramesses II uh, reigned for a very long time. He lived into his 90s, had dozens of kids, and a lot of them actually passed away before he did. So he ended up being um, succeeded by his 13th son, I think it was, Muneptah. But uh, a lot of them actually predeceased him, and so they were actually buried in this enormous tomb. Uh, until recently, it wasn't known how big it was. KV5 was actually discovered fairly early on. That's why it's got a low number, indicating it was the fifth tomb explored. But they only actually explored the entrance passage and didn't realise until they started to clear out some of the rubble how enormous it was. And it wasn't until the 1990s that they actually started to clear the whole thing. And it hasn't actually been cleared yet. They're still working their way through all of these chambers. But there's, it's, there's heaps of stuff to be discovered. Now, it was pillaged, 
So there's not any fabulous grave goods or anything like that in there. But nonetheless, it's uh, still pretty impressive uh, what has been found and will continue to be found as this tomb is excavated. Last one I want to briefly look at, we'll look at this in more detail next week, the whole uh, story of the exploration of Tutankhamun's tomb and its discovery. It was discovered in 1922 and as is quite well known, it's the only royal burial that has been discovered that was substantially intact. A little, there was a break in probably very soon after the king was buried, but other than that, it was intact right down to the modern period. It was discovered by Howard Carter in 1922, and you can see the treasures of Tutankhamun for the most part in the Grand Egyptian Museum that's located in Cairo in Egypt. Recently, everything was moved there from the Egyptian Museum in downtown Cairo and other places and moved out to a new museum out near the pyramids uh, in Cairo or in Giza. So uh, you, that, all of the treasures of Tutankhamun have now been brought together in the same place for the first time. You can see here some of the grave goods, these statues, gold-plated statues of the king, um, these benches, beds and so forth. There's an amazing amount of stuff that was discovered. And again, we'll have a bit of a look at that uh, next week when we're discussing the tomb of Tutankhamun. Here we have the sarcophagus. Originally it was surrounded by four gilded shrines. And there's the second coffin here, which is gold-plated wood. Uh, there was originally a coffin outside that and another one of solid gold inside it. And then there was the mummy and the death mask inside that. As I mentioned before, it had been concealed when the workers for Ramesses VI tomb had actually built their huts over the entrance of the tomb and thus buried it and ensured that no one else would find it until Howard Carter managed to find it in 1922. So that's a bit of pretty much it, uh, what I wanted to cover for the Theban necropolis. Um, as I mentioned, have a look at that uh, BBC's documentary on YouTube, Life and Death in the Valley of the Kings. Very impressive, telling you all about, in particular, Car and Merit, but also a lot of information about the Theban necropolis generally and the lives of the workers at Deir el Medina in particular. So I'll sign off now until next time. Thank you.